Okay, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It was great to, to see you and to, uh, excuse me, I have a slight technical problem. How, how can you manage that on an occasion like this? But still, what? there we are, I'm back. My apologies. Yeah, so a great introduction, Alan. And I, I remember some of those occasions, you remind me of others that I had overlooked and forgotten. Uh, I'm going to share my screen more or less straight away to get on. Uh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, great to be here at CNC 2021 in Venice. Only I wish it was really in Venice, but I look forward to 20. 22. Um, <clears throat> Linda and I founded Creativity and Cognition, as Alan has already told you, in 1993. And so here we are crossing the boundaries between 1993 and Venice. This picture isn't taken this year, I took it a few years ago, but anyway. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, Linda to you, she could say some words during this talk. Um, we started it and I'm going to go through some of the background to that beginning of the conference. It was a long time ago, 1993, in computing terms. Uh, the standard uh, office computer was the Macintosh in those days. Um, and many, many things that everyone is completely used to today didn't exist. So it was very different. Although the concerns that we have today at this conference are very similar actually to those we had then. And I'll talk about some of the ways that the, that similarity has in fact shifted. In fact, an interest in creativity and computing goes back further, goes back a long way. But if you think in terms of conferences, this was a conference held in 1970 in Brunel University in England uh, called CG70, Computer Graphics 70. And it had a stream of papers about computer-based art. And some of that computer-based art was shown in the art gallery, uh, part of the exhibition associated with the conference. They didn't talk about creativity as such. They talked about art. SIGGRAPH, which has also been mentioned, had its first serious art exhibition in 1981. And by 1989 was producing papers, getting published, guess what, in Leonardo, that journal that you've heard mentioned a couple of times already. But none of these meetings talked about creativity as such or the process and or ways of supporting the process. They really talked about the outcomes of the creative use of computers. Creativity itself grew in interest in the years that followed. And I went to loads of conferences about creativity, about art using computers, about computers being used to do something to deal with creativity and so on. But there was a problem with them. One set of them were meetings of artists or creative practitioners, designers. This is one of them, an important one. This was the first symposium on electronic art, ISEA. Uh, this was a very exciting program, but it didn't really contain much work by computer scientists, by cognitive scientists. It was all stuff by artists, very great. And this is still running. The next one will be uh, next year, in Barcelona, so this is still going on. Another set of meetings I went to were all computer scientists and hard nut people concerned with creativity. And this is a conference series that began in 1989 on this little island off the coast of Australia called Heron Island. Uh, and it continued and it had its 30th anniversary meeting in, 19, in 2019, 30 years on from the very first one. Um, 
But this had the opposite problem. Um, it was really a meeting of computer scientists and let's say hard nut people talking about how to model creativity uh, or how to make computers be creative and so on. And very much lacking in creative people talking about their creative work. And so my concern was that there were these communities interested in creativity. On one side, creative people practicing creativity. On the other side, AI people and computer scientists wanting to model creativity. And they weren't meeting. These conferences weren't meeting. So I want to go over to this question. What motivated us to start Creativity and Cognition bearing in mind that background. I'd like to pass over to Linda to speak about that from her point of view. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and thank you very much to, um, to Ellen and Celine and to Brian for organizing this event. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to, to speak about something of the origins of the conference series. And I have to say how thrilled I am that it's going so strongly now and so much better than it was. And, <laughs> and if I may take you back, I know this is going to be a hard, this is hard even for me, but if I can take you back to uh, 1993, uh, that's the pre-Sigkai um, uh, conference. And what, what motivated what, the starting point there? Well, just imagine 1993. Some of you won't remember it. Some of you probably weren't around. Um, and think that was a, because of a watershed year. That was the year of um, the first time that the web became available for general use. So we are going back a long way. And it took some time before the web was even exploited in, in a, a small way. It was, it was a year when we had this enormously important thing called Mosaic, which was the very first browser that you could browse the web, assuming you knew what the web was. Um, and well, how did how you might think? Well, how on earth did we communicate in those days without without this, um, without the web, without e we had email? That was a great uh, innovation. But we used these things called telephones, which were um, st they were attached to um, uh, desks by wires, and um, you usually there was only one in the room and uh, it worked if you were lucky you were a very privileged person if you got a telephone because that showed your status was higher so so how on earth did we communicate you might think well here we are now those of you who are digital natives will will think of um, gathering on gather town and on zoom as you know perfectly normal um but i'm afraid some of the, we dinosaurs of who survived the the, the the turmoil of living in the 90s, it, it, we kind of continue to be amazed about it all. But nevertheless, we were motivated to start a conference series that was going to be, we hoped, and we intended to be international, to be uh, cross disciplines. Well, why would we, did we want to do that? Um, you have to try and imagine what it felt like in those days. And what there had to be pretty strong motivation to want to do it. Anyway, um, I was attending Kai conferences and other smaller conferences, but what I realized very quickly, I'd come from an arts background anyway, so I and education, and I would go to these computing meetings and even HCI meetings where they were a fairly homogenous lot, mostly male, uh, mostly of one racial group, mostly computer scientists. Well, sometimes you've got a psychologist in there occasionally. Sometimes you've got a designer in there, if you were lucky. And um, what the impression I got was that the people outside didn't, didn't really, outside that area didn't really belong. And it seemed to me that um, coming from my background, I'd come into computing about uh, five years before. I'd been involved with a lot of different kinds of projects. It seemed to me there was something very, very missing in this, this situation. And, and the, the, there was nowhere to go where you could meet people from really different backgrounds. And as Ernest pointed out in his introduction, there were meetings where that was happening. But the problem was they were, all weren't meeting together. 
So that was one of the important motivating forces. Why, how could we get people like artists, people like uh, creative technologists together and, and bring them into the same space, the same physical space? Um, but that wasn't the only problem. The, the other problem that, as I perceived it, was that most of the attention being given to the development of digital systems was to do with about increasing productivity. So you would have the mantra was efficiency, effectiveness, and with a nod to user satisfaction. And I say a nod to because that was a kind of afterthought from, from many system developers. Um, and, and the emphasis was all on making things user friendly. What was missing as, I, as far as I could see was any attention to the more creative uses of uh, the technologies. And it was very obvious that there were quite severe limitations on the systems that were being developed. It seemed to me what we really needed was a forum where creativity would be taken more seriously and that we acknowledge the acceptance and the importance of different perspectives from very, very different backgrounds, very, very different experiences coming together to learn from one another. And so that was the first motivating force as far as I was concerned. I'll hand back to Ernest now because I'm sure he has plenty more to say about this. Thank you, Linda. So uh, let's share my screen again. Uh, yes, what motivates us to start? Well, there's some ideas about that. Let's go over some of this history a little bit and try to give you some of the... Uh, oops, I'm sorry, I need to jump through to where we were up to. Uh, well, one of the things that's interesting is in, in our community, the Kai community, uh, human-computer interaction has changed its focus over the years. And I'm pleased to say that enhancing creativity is there, but it wasn't always there. And a few quotes to give you some idea of this history. Um, 1947, this was pretty good really, that any machine coding system should be judged quite largely from the point of view of how easy it is for the operator, that's what we often call the user, to obtain results, so ease of use. By 1982, uh, Tom Malone was talking about enjoyable user interfaces and lessons from computer games, right? So this was shifting the focus to the uh, pleasure that the user might feel and the uh, captivation that the user might have with that user interface. Excuse me. Okay. And then by 1984, we got experience design, this famous note on experience design, where the whole idea being to design computer systems around the notion of, let's call it the user experience. And then in the creativity and cognition conferences, we went through a process of trying to make this normal. And I'll say some more about this in a few minutes, but in 96, we actually felt we could say that the design of creativity support computer systems is now fully on the research agenda. Well, it still is on the research agenda and we still haven't solved all those problems, have we? Uh, and we've been trying to deal with this with all these, this is a list of conferences, you can't read this, but that's all the conferences that we've had, creativity and cognition, starting back in 1993. This is the poster for the first such conference that we held in Loughborough, England. Now, when Linda and I came up with this idea, actually we were wandering around an island off the coast of um, the Netherlands uh, on New Year's Eve with some artist friends. And we came up with the need to do this and thought, how do we do it? Well, we hadn't thought about approaching the ACM or anything like that. We didn't think about approaching anyone. I was fortunately uh, head of a research centre in a university at Loughborough. I had some resources and some power enough to put this on, underwriting it from the resources that I already had control over. So 
we just did it off our back with the help of our friends, with the cooperation of the people who helped us. This is Loughborough University where we started all this. You notice at the bottom of that uh, poster, there's a description of the conference, the basic idea of the conference. And I think this description still applies. Artists, musicians, designers, cognitive scientists, and so on and so on, so on present ideas on creativity and cognition across the boundaries of art and science. And the bringing people together from these different disciplines was the crucial idea that I think is very much still with us. It's interesting that we had uh, five keynote speakers in the very first meeting. And it's worth me just mentioning who they were because that illustrates the point. Uh, there was Margaret Bowden, her name has already been mentioned, famous for her pioneering work in artificial intelligence and cognitive science. And she had been working on and has worked ever since on um, artificial intelligence models of creativity and so on. So very much a sort of AI cog-sci perspective. Then we had Gerhard Fischer, well known in our Kaya community, of course, working on creativity with an AI flavor. Um, so computer scientist with an HCI bent. An artist, Michael Kidner, a very thoughtful artist using mathematics who had done very little with computing at that time, but had thought about it a lot. So an artist, a practitioner of creativity. Brian Lawson from architecture, famous for his studies of architects and their design process. He's written a few famous books. For example, How Designers Think, perfect title I think he got there. Uh, he's interviewed some of the leading art architects in the world. So he's expert in the design process, in the creative design process. Of course, he involved himself with computers somewhat too, but that was very much a secondary part of his work. And then Stephen Willits, another artist who's worked on social aspects of art, community building, art made up, in the community, around the community. So art from different aspects, AI, computer science, design coming together. We had an art exhibition in the very first uh, meeting. This was pretty tough because we actually had to build these walls. We had to build the space in which the exhibition took place as well as hang the work. Um, Interesting papers, for example, this one by Chris Frith and John Law. Chris Frith, uh, a scientist, and John Law, an artist, uh, working on the psychological processes of drawing, trying to understand the drawing process, crucial to trying to support the drawing process. If, you, if we write computer systems to support drawing, we have to understand how drawing works. So this was a contribution to that kind of thing, for example. The audience, the, the, the guy at the front there, Sugawara, a Japanese sculptor, sitting beside him to his left in the picture, Margaret Bowden, I've already mentioned, and in the audience there, people from other completely different disciplines. So this wasn't just a Kai community, it was a mixed community, that was the crucial point. And it went on, we did, an, we did another one, again, supported from my group uh, and its funding in 96. Um, in the middle there is Frida Narka, uh, computer graphics expert, artist. The head, highest head up there on the right is an architect. This is uh, Roy Ascot, an artist speaking about his work. He produced the first paper really in the 1960s, talking about how telecommunications and art could come together and, and how telecommunications could influence the artist. And here's a bunch of artists, me included there, uh, who uh, were all at that meeting. 
Interestingly, um, Alan kindly mentioned my SIGGRAPH award for lifetime achievement in digital art. Well, two of the other people in this photograph have also received that award. Uh, and not many people have received it. So Roman Borosco and Manfred Moore there. So we had quite a good gathering. And then sometime between 96 and 99, I talked with uh, the SIG Kai committee and persuaded them, and they didn't need much persuading, that Creativity and Cognition was an interesting enough conference series to be sponsored by SIG Kai. So the third one was now an ACM conference, as we are still today. Uh, keynote speakers were interesting here too. Uh, Harold Cohen, uh, the late Harold Cohen was one of those keynote speakers. Uh, and this is a drawing, his computer program, Aron, produced for us for the cover of our proceedings. Uh, Another person who's no longer with us, you can't hardly see this because it's a very bad old photograph, but I show it to you because this is Marvin Minsky, one of the founding figures of artificial intelligence, who was also at the conference cuddling our cat in the garden. But he didn't only cuddle cats. Here he is cuddling a robot arm. And this is a very interesting picture that uh, one of the delegates took Again, it's old and not of great quality, but please look at it. It does say a lot about where creativity and cognition came from, what it was doing then, and what it is still doing today. And I'll just go through this picture. Okay, on the right is Marvin Minsky. He's holding a hand of a robot arm. That robot arm is being held by, on the left, Ben Schneiderman. They're shaking hands. I'll say something else about that in a moment. The very smiley, bald man in the middle is Stellark, the performance artist, and it's his robot arm. This robot arm is used in his artworks. Uh, and he, he was another keynote speaker at that meeting. And looking on is Gerhard Fischer, who I've already mentioned. Gerhard kind of bridges AI and HCI from the HCI point of view. But this picture shows, this is the way I like to look at it, how art brings HCI and AI together. I think neither uh, of these, none of these people would mind me saying this, but Marvin, um, bless him, never really thought that HCI had a great deal to offer computing. It could all be solved by AI. Ben, at that time, was very committed that AI had nothing much to offer and that HCI would solve all the problems. Ben is now working very hard on making sure that we have a human-centered AI world. And here we see these two guys coming together through art. And that, in a way, is a symbol of what we have been achieving in these conference series. And we moved on. Ben Schneiderman kindly offered to take on uh, one of these meetings. And as Alan mentioned in 2007, it went to Washington DC and it was a very successful meeting there, including uh, a public art exhibition. Uh, Pamela Jennings here, she was curated that exhibition and so on. Then. Uh, in 2009, it went to California, to Berkeley, uh, and was a very successful one there, very much involving uh, performance as well as visual art and many, many interesting papers, performances. And a, a keynote paper by the famous Chipsen Mihaly, uh, famous for flow, and all our theory about uh, creativity speaking to us at the conference. So again, from another discipline, but a very important one informing us. Out of this came lots of things and just a few personal things. We created a research program at Loughborough University uh, out of what we learned from the early conferences. Um, we 
in those early conferences was included like a panel discussion of the leading funding bodies from the UK, the Arts Council of England, the Science and Engineering Research Council and so on. And one of the great things that came out of it was that the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK changed the description of what counted as research in HCI by about two words. And those two words were creativity support. And as a result of adding those two words in their description, we and others were able to get funding to study the kind of stuff that gets reported all the time nowadays at this conference series. So actually we had influence outside of uh, the scientific world and the art world. We also had influence on the funding world. Um, we moved to create another group in, in Sydney in Australia, bluer skies, um, but the same kind of work. And another thing that came out of it, which was also very important in the US, was Ben Schneiderman and Gerhard Fischer and other important people got together and persuaded the National uh, Science Foundation to fund a workshop on creativity support tools. I think this was a very important workshop and almost anyone you care to mention who was well known in the field in 2005 was there or if they didn't make it was invited. So it was a quite an important event lasting several days with lots of intense discussion and many things came out of it. The reports are all available and I recommend more homework reading these reports. They're still valid. But just to put up a list, I won't go through this in detail, but for example, out of these discussions came principles for building creativity support tools. So you, you might choose to call them other things than creativity support tools, but basically software systems that somehow or another help people be more creative. And there, there's a list of some of these things, which are different criteria to those that we see in just any old HCI description, because we're not trying to help people achieve a particular goal in a particular way. It's not task oriented, it's creative process oriented. And these lead to rather different criteria. So I recommend looking these up. They're still valid and important to us today. And lots of other things came out of it, lots of books. Some of them have been mentioned already uh, and many others. These are the ones that came out from our group and others like us. And activities outside. So Stella, like I mentioned, he was a keynote speaker at CNC, well, he was then chosen to be a keynote speaker at CHI. And many art activities then started to grow in CHI. And by 2016, we had an art exhibition outside of the conference so that the public could come. But what you see here is the conference attending the opening at the exhibition. And as you can see, it was pretty crowded and pretty popular. And so the Kaya community somehow uh, grabbed all this art and liked it and spent a lot of time uh, at it and looking at it and talking to the artists and were prepared to queue, as you can see, quite a long way to get in to see it. So that was a success, I think. Now, I think uh, <coughs> I mentioned this change and Linda also mentioned the shift in over time. And I just looked through the titles of papers at different CHI conferences and has just a quick flavor of how it has shifted over the years in, we might say proudly, our direction. So in 1981, these were common words you saw in the titles. Friendliness was good, performance, effectiveness, product, productive, stress, these kind of words. By 2011, other words appear, creative, emotion, experience, expressive, feel. And by 2017, harmony, moods, awareness, empowered, mindfulness, empathy. What a shift in thinking in what computer human interaction is about. So that has been changing in the direction of our 
conference. So we're doing very well, and you can see from this conference program that it's a very exciting world we are in today. But what next? Well, of course, who knows what next is, but let me just give you a few points uh, from my perspective. Things that I think we should be concentrating on now a little harder maybe than we are. Well, it's just a quick plug for a book I published, which is to turn the tables a little bit and to say, well, HCI and computing can learn from creative practitioners and their research. So it's not just what can or we great computing people offer the creatives, but what can they offer us? And what I show here is that uh, artists know quite a lot. Uh, they can teach HCI people quite a lot. There's quite a lot of research in the arts, in the visual arts in particular, and in interactive art that is very relevant to HCI. The last question there, are artists different? Well, yes, this isn't learning from everyday creativity. This is learning from the extreme ends. Any good physicist looks at the boundary conditions, right? If you're interested in creativity, look at the boundary conditions, look at the extreme conditions. The people who are not creative at all or the people who are extremely creative, like successful designers and architects and artists, for example. Now, every newspaper you pick up today has AI mentioned in it somewhere. So we have to mention AI, don't we? Well, where is AI and creativity? Well, I mentioned these Heron Island conferences and they started with a lot of people thinking that the whole point was to have computers become creative and take over, right? Well, and I argued right from the beginning that that was exactly the wrong way around. Um, so can AI imitate art? Well, it can, and we can have learning systems that learn how to do another version of something that artists have done for a long time before, but be careful. Some people in Sydney uh, did this and produced the floor plans of buildings that were in the style of a particularly famous Australian architect. And they went and produced a new floor plan and went to the architect to say, hey, look, we've just produced a new floor plan, which is just like you design. And he said, well, yeah, that's just how I used to do it. Right? But he'd, of course, moved on. But the AI didn't move on. So all it was doing was imitating what he used to do. Can an AI make art? Well, it make art that robots might like, but it, art is a human activity that only humans can do. AI may be able to help artists make art, but not make it itself. Can it be the artist? Well, no. The real question is AI or IA, artificial intelligence or intelligence augmentation. In our community, creativity and cognition, we're interested in intelligence augmentation. Um, I think it's important that we stress this and put a lot more work into working out how that is best done and try to bend the AI community to support this work. Social media and creativity, collaborative creativity is very much in our minds today because collaboration is very much in our mind through the social media that we have. And here there are many research questions, I won't go through this list, uh, that we really need to address and could be very important things for us to think about in the future. And then reflective practice and creativity. And perhaps if I leave my slide on, I could ask Linda to talk about this from her point of view. And she's more expert in this by a long way than I am. Linda. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Ennis, and thank you for covering the ground so well. I think um, I, I'm not sure I've got an to offer, but maybe I, I will say something about what, what does creativity look like now? And, well, what, what has it always looked like? But perhaps we haven't been looking hard enough. Um, what do you see here on, on the photographs? You see a creative team at work. This is the Stalker Theatre people working with um, a, a group of technologists from uh, the U University of Technology, Sydney. 
um, pro producing interactive performances for children. And, and, and of course, they're a great theater company. They do this kind of thing. They collaborate with people across the world. And creativity, as we understand it, is so often reductive in the way that we end up modeling it. We have to be very careful about that. Um, it's very dangerous to do that. And, if we, and here we are looking at creativity in action, in teamwork, but also creativity, people working in solitude. And you see the row, if you look at the row of people with, on them, their machines, they're not exactly um, alone. They're, they're, they're alone together, as it were, in the same room, but they are being creative in a different way to the way they are sitting down on the floor. You can see them sitting around with their people pe pieces of paper, it's the same team at work here. And one of the important things is that there's a very close relationship between the understanding what it is that are the true elements of creative action. And the reflection that goes in there is both a team reflection and reflection in solitude. And you, you can't have one without the other. Both creativity operates in both those domains. And we, we are not very creative if we don't feel comfortable in solitude. That's very important to understand. I mean, I'm just rereading Sherry Turkle's book on reclaiming conversation. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, everything she says there applies even more so about the our relationship to our technologies and how we need to give ourselves space. And so the reflective part of it is very important. And I've been very interested in trying to see the creative process from the inside. What is it that the creative practitioners as individuals and as teams do and how do they think? And reflection, of course, it's not just the same as I think, there is much more to do with, with there. There's a lot of ways in which reflection operates in the creative process. It's absolutely vital. Those of you who've read Donald Schoen's book, The Reflective Practitioner, will know he kicked off this whole question in 1983 about the nature of practitioner knowledge and how does that work and how is that different? What is the difference between evidence-based knowledge and practice-based knowledge? And that's a very, very important distinction. Um, one of the things I'm very interested in is that relationship between theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge and how those two interrelate. So Ernest, if you could just go to the next one. I'm, this, I'm going to do my own little plug here for my book. This, <laughs> this is actually talking about it, working from Donald Schoen's original ideas. There is, it's, it's got interviews. All of it is about how practitioners think in different disciplines in the creative world and how they collaborate reflectively and how they work individually. And the, and. Um, I'm very much indebted to Donald Schoen's thinking. He, he was behind my first postgraduate degree and, and this book really comes out of that original work. So those of you who haven't as yet discovered Donald Schoen, please do. And if you want a shortened version of what, what his thinking is, you can read my book too. <laughs> so, um, and the last thing to say about this is that creative practice and creative practitioners don't just practice, they do research and the reflection is all part of the research. And one of the things that we're, we're just on the verge of putting into production is a book on practice-based research. So this book, building on the creative practitioner's perspective is, is again, there are something like 50 plus chapters written by practitioners about the way they do research, why they, they practice it, and they research and how research and practice comes in tandem. So if you don't know about practice-based research, this is a, I think this is a very important way of in, in bringing in a new paradigm for research, research into the creativity world. And I would strongly urge people who are involved in research processes to, to, to explore this. You can see the kinds of things that um, we're, we're looking at there. So I think that's, that's for me and, uh, I'll hand back to Ernest to, to round yeah. up. Thank you, Linda. So most of my academic career, that part of my life, has been conducting and supervising, sometimes examining, practice-based research. And my latest example I showed and talked about at this conference in Sydney. This is the last conference I attended physically 
just before it was impossible to attend intend to anything physically in Sydney and Australia. And this was um, uh, distributed, interactive, augmented artwork between Sydney and China. Uh, it doesn't matter about what the work was, but here was a bunch of people working together with me, producing the work, examining the work, experiencing it, and trying to learn more about creativity in this context of the distributed, interactive, augmented world, which is another way of putting uh, a pointer to the future for me. But if we look back where we started in those gray distant days, one of the key things there was all the different disciplines. I see there uh, people from at least five different disciplines uh, in those pictures. Uh, and this still applies to us today. And that is perhaps one of the key things we need to think about for the future. Go back to this picture. This symbolizes what we're doing today, what I hope we will do tomorrow, what I hope we will do next year in uh, Venice and in 2024, wherever that turns out to be. Uh, thank you very much from myself and from Linda also. Uh, we, it's very great pleasure to be here uh, in virtual Venice. Uh, and I hope the rest of the conference goes very well. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. I love seeing all the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we do have time so people can ask questions. So if you want to just jump in or raise your hand <laughs> to ask questions. Well, I can, I can ask a question. This is uh, Brian Bailey. Um, Ernest, thank you so much for your, um, your presentation and, and thanks to Linda as well. Um, in most of your photos, they were, they were um, adults. And I was just curious about um, kids and teaching creative thinking skills in K-12 education. So you could approach this maybe from a couple different angles um, for my question. But one is like, like when I teach my undergraduate courses at the university, what are the important skills that I should teach students from the perspective of creativity? And for maybe also then for kids in K-12, I have two, uh, two kids uh, under the age of 12. You know, what should we be teaching in K-12 education uh, for creative thinking? So maybe either from those uh, perspectives. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Brian. Well, I mean, in a sense, the, the quick answer is the same for both, which is to tolerate failure, <laughs> right? So the most important thing in being creative is to take risk and expect that that risk will lead to something that doesn't work and to learn from not working uh, and to tolerate that, that failure. Um, I think that for, um, uh, uh, for the older people, for the, for the uh, grown up students, I might say, then I think the point is to think about uh, pr the process, the preparation uh, before the creative act. So it's only too easy to think that being creative is kind of splashing lots of stuff around, trying lots of things out and something will pop up. But it doesn't really work like that. It, uh, usually that creative moment, that flash of inspiration, that sudden something where it feels creative is based upon a long period of gestation and practice and so on. So I often think of the Japanese ink painters who spend maybe a few seconds making some fab fabulous piece of work with a brush and a pot of ink. But usually they've spent 10 years working on it so that the process of suddenly doing it is very uh, open and easy. For the young people, I think the point is to keep them open. So I have found in my uh, experience, I've had some several examples where I've shown work and I've had 
Uh, I remember one exhibition where people would come around and ask me questions like, well, what does it mean? Or how am I meant to interpret this? And so on and so forth. But in a very uncreative way. But children come in and just respond to it immediately, wave at a screen and so on, and ask me completely straightforward questions, sometimes that flummox me. Like I remember one child saying to me, "How uh, this was a painting which just had like five squares of different colors or something. So he said, uh, so how long did it take you to do that? And I said, well, you know, it took a year or two to do that really. And then he said, well, how did it, how is it you did something so simple, so it takes so long over it, you know? And, and I talked with him about smooth pebbles and how long it takes to that. And he was very responsive to that and understood that. And I found kids very open to these things. They don't need explanation and so on. And what adults often do is cut their thinking down. Right? So instead of encouraging them to look and respond, they give them interpretations. And those interpretations are actually restricting their thinking. So, so for young people, it's mostly a question of being open. Plus this other thing that I mentioned already, of uh, encouraging them to tolerate failure. So that, you know, that was interesting. Perhaps I could add something to that, um, Brian, is I think I mentioned the importance of living with solitude. I think that has to start early. And one of the things that we do in school, I was a teacher before I became a researcher for about 20 years. And, and I, I remember very well that um, the people that so I was teaching teenagers, you know, the sort of 11 to 14 year olds, they really wanted to, when they were thinking about new ideas and, want, and being asked to do a task, they very often were encouraged to talk about it uh, with their with other kids in the class. And I found that that didn't always work for all children. And sometimes it was very important to say to them, you can spend time on your own. First of all, I want you to spend time thinking for yourself. And I think that's very important that we, we, we put so much emphasis on social interaction that we forget that it's also quite important that we as individuals need to discover ourselves and learn to live in our own space. And I think that once you feel comfortable in your own space, you can, it builds a child's confidence. They can then interact more with other children and more confidently at any rate. And as adults, of course. Yeah. Can I follow up quickly? Just, <laughs> Ellen, you mind? I, I just, I was gonna summarize like what I, what I took away. Um, Right now, in, in many courses, we tend to reward students for having good outcomes. And what I took away is maybe I should be rewarding students for having good process and a good mindset. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. You've captured um, it perfectly. OK, so I see a hand from Nail and also Corina. So Nail first. Thank you, Ernest and Linda. That, that look back was fascinating. Um, some faces and names I've forgotten about. Um, my question is really around roles and disciplines. Uh, the roles that people fulfill nowadays are evolving. Some of the most, some of the artists I know are more technically gifted than computer science graduates. We see other blending of roles and, and activities. Are there new disciplines or types of people you would like to see involved in next year's conference or conferences in the future? Is there a trend or a direction you can extrapolate from in your, uh, in your perspective, from your perspective? Um, well, Linda probably has some comments on this too, but let me start. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, a difficult question because um, some of the people I most want to encourage are people who don't fit in a discipline. I always think that the hot area is on the boundaries between things. So, so people who, who do that are most interesting. But I think that in certain countries, this isn't uh, worldwide really, but in the UK where you are, for example, a lot of people do these practice-based PhDs. They're very interesting people to get because um, they have done work practicing creative work in whatever field, could be music or digital art or something else, design. 
uh, but reflecting on it and doing research about it. So they, they are kind of crossing this boundary. And they, I, I think, are well placed to contribute to our community in interesting ways. So I would sort of try to encourage that kind of student next time uh, to come. And, and it's not just in the UK, uh, Scandinavia do it. There are a couple, two or three universities in America do it, Australians do it, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, I think otherwise, I would like uh, rather bizarrely to encourage some of these AI people interested in creativity, in, in modeling creativity and building creative systems to come along and have a fight. So maybe like a panel with people like that, uh, having a good argument with some real Kai type people to, to, to try to hammer this out because I think it's a very important issue uh, to, to try to understand. So that's my quick answer. Linda, do you have something to add to that? Yes, I could, I could add to that. Um, I, I fully endorse what Dennis has just said, uh, Neil. But I would also say uh, perhaps there are other people who we might consider for, the, for this community. Um, one of the people I interviewed for my book was um, a guy who was the, one of the originators of the Sci Art program um, run by Wellcome Trust. In, 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 and that was a very important um, initiative that brought together artists with, with pure scientists and medical scientists and, and in the biomedical world. Um, and but one of the things that um, uh, his, uh, he said was that bring it, he, you, could, you couldn't have interdisciplinary without disciplines. And so there was a kind of way in which we had to foster disciplines at the same time as encouraging people to exchange and to get different perspectives. And he had um, mechanisms for bringing people together to create exhibitions for the Wellcome Foundation, for example, in their art gallery. Um, and, and what they used to do was to turn the problem on its head, basically, ask the people who were from one discipline to um, not do it in their, their normal way of doing things, but to look at it from the point of view of the other team who were perhaps from a, an entirely different discipline. So there were ways in which uh, that kind of thinking, the, the pure scientists, the pure biomedical people could be brought in and, 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 and actually given their perspectives that would, would, would sub, in, a, in a sense, do a little bit about, about what Ernest is suggesting with the AI people, subvert the way people think conventionally. And one of the people who came out of that program was a, um, a, a surgeon called, um, if I can remember his name, it's going to go, he, he's just, just written a book on expertise and his name's just gone for me. And he brings together people from, say, craft, craft work, people who make pots, people who carve in wood with um, surgeons and, and people who work at different levels and, and to look for the common, commonalities in their processes, uh, how they use gesture, for example, by them sitting talking to one another. And it seemed to me that was a beautiful model to take people right away from the people who don't do research necessary in the obvious sense of the word, People come out of craft and bring them in and ask them to talk about what they do with other people from an entirely different background. And I think that could be a very interesting model for how um, a, a forum like this develops its, um, its thinking. Okay, that, that's fascinating. Thank you. And just in terms of Ernest's provocation, one of the lined up keynotes for 22 is coming in from the computational creativity community. So oh, yeah. exactly that purpose of forcing these conversations again. Excellent. So and could I just add, I've just remembered the name of the person that you should invite is Roger Nebo. He's a professor of medicine at um, Queen Mary, London. And he, he is the, he's a brilliant and he, he runs a a, a series of pod, podcasts on this so if you look up uh, his conversations um that will give you some idea of the kind of people who, 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 he, i'm sure he'd be a great speaker okay we have a hand from corina and then nagas yes thank you for the keynotes uh, keynote uh, very very interesting uh i have a question for linda um and I really enjoy the way you, you brought together creative thinking and reflective thinking to very powerful high-level functions. So my, my interest would be, how do they 
interact with each other. Are there any specific processes in creative thinking that can elevate the reflective thinking and the other way around? And I will also expect that there is a, there is a potential negative effect, effect as well if too much creativity is infused into the reflective thinking, maybe we might become less reflective. So I'm just interested in the interaction between the two. Yes, yes that's a very interesting question. Thank you. And, and um, you're right. There is, there is this, well, it's a, a dilemma for many creative people, people who are makers and who are working with very... Um, critical processes where the, the, that you have to get it done within in a given time frame you have a lot of pressure you and the, the procedures are very precise yes there can be great difficulty then and one of the things um, that Donald Schoen talked about and which I've expanded on in my, in my book is this notion of reflection at a distance where you um, put in measures whereby the actual process of reflecting is delayed in order that you can then um, be, just do it. I think the, the whole thing about non-reflective thinking is very important. Um, so how does that, are there, there are distinct mechanisms that, that artists use a lot, the makers use a lot. Um, most people who are successful, and it, it, it varies when you, you see this with early creatives, the lack of, um, uh, ability to think think and reflect is not a it's not a criticism of any kind but it's a sign that it it takes time to establish the processes that you need to know well enough before you can start to to reflect on them and i think um, it's very important that people should build confidence in that that, that there's nothing they don't have to think all the time they should be uh, encouraged to just do it to let it go as many many artists say but it, 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 I, what I've noticed with the artists who do practice-based research is that they first of all struggle with it and then they discover they can handle it. It's a discovery process. So I don't have any um, silver bullets for this, but it is a learning process like anything else. And you can learn to reflect superficially. You can re re learn to reflect in the moment, in the making moment. Um, or you can learn to delay and reflect at a distance. And one of the things I think that's quite important is that it's what people do when something happens uh, that they, that's unexpected, that's really valuable. It's a bit like the risk-taking notion that, that when something unexpected happens, how do you reflect at that moment? Do you reflect in a negative way? Do you reflect in a positive way? And uh, Sharon talks about this in different terms, but it's a very important mechanism for developing the capacity to be a good creative, reflective practitioner. Thank you, Linda. All right, Nagas, ask your question. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the wonderful talk. It was immensely refreshing to travel back and see the history of this conference and see how it all came together, the, the shift that Ernest was talking about in terms of thinking about HCI and creativity, that was wonderful. So looking into the future, and I know you already talked about some of this answering Neil's question, I'm asking what are the biggest challenges that you wish researcher in this area address in the next 10 years or so? So in other hand, some directions to inspire new researchers in this area. So again, we probably both have comments on this, um, but I'll jump in and give my comment first, which is that I think the biggest challenge is comes out of this reflective practice uh, concept that Linda has talked about and that is in her book. And it's this, that um, we have looked very much at the subject of creativity from the outside looking at creative behaviors and trying to understand and so on uh, by observing uh, by gathering data about how people are more or less creative what their childhood was like and all these kinds of things i think the challenge is to find out from the inside and this can only be done uh, with the more than the cooperation of the creative practitioners themselves 
with the creative practitioners as a key element of the research team, even perhaps as the key researcher themselves. So, um, uh, and I think that the, this process of reflection, Linda was talking about it just the last moments, uh, is, is really important here. So I think the challenge is about research methods as much as research questions. And I think there's a need to move those research methods. And if you think of the Kaya community, it has changed its research methods over the years, and it needs to shift again in this direction. For example, it used to do experimental work in the lab where you found out really accurate results about really tiny, not very important things, and became more and more in terms of ethnography and field work and so on, where you found out less reliable results about much more important questions. And maybe we're moving in that direction and this research from the inside is maybe even less reliable in the sense it gets to be more and more specific to this particular individual or the small group of individuals, but maybe dealing with much deeper questions and therefore maybe offer greater in, insights. Uh, so I think this is the biggest challenge. Linda, you probably agree with that, or I hope you do. Well, yes, I do. Um, I think I'm always an optimist, and I'm, I think that the pandemic has taught us something, is that we have to learn to live in very, very different circumstances, and, and our worlds can be turned upside down very quickly. So I think we, we, have, to be, we have to prepare ourselves for that. One of the things I th think is um, of concern to look from the inside means that you have to perhaps consider experiencing it. I have always been as a teacher and as a researcher looking from the outside, although I have always had an inkling that I needed to be a maker as well. And I think it, perhaps one of our big challenges of the future is to ask ourselves, all of us, whatever we do in whatever domain, is how far can we push our creativity ourselves as individuals? I'm sure all of us, every person here is in a small way, creative all the time. But is there something that we can focus on in our lives which um, would be a, a longer term exploration of creativity? I've only really at a very late age in, in my life started to write properly, uh, as in creative writing. <laughs> I've always done analytical writing. What I, when, I, when I was an English teacher, I would call it transactional writing, you know, communication. I've started to write um, more creative as in the sense of more expressive writing. And I have discovered things about myself and about the process of writing and about the making of poems and pieces of prose that I never would have done by just looking at it in the way I used to as an English teacher, as an English um, specialist. And I think, I'm sure many of you are doing things already. I, I, I absolutely guarantee that in a community like this, there are many, many more creative people than, in, than normally in any conference. But how far do you push your creativity? So I think maybe the challenge for the future is for us as individuals to make, to enlarge, think, think about, or we hope we won't have a pandemic for, forever, but you never know. You never know what the world is going to bring. And we to challenge ourselves with our own creativity is to prepare ourselves for a much longer term fulfilling life. Thank you for your question. May I just add something to that, which occurred to me as Linda was talking, which is that maybe this isn't itself a challenge, but maybe an emphasis that might be worthy of uh, considering, which is two things. One is to make sure that as part of the mix, we look as, our, as a community at and with very seriously creative people, the top architects, the top designers, the top composers and whatever. And not just everyday creativity, how we choose the best holiday and whatnot. Uh, so I think that, that we need to make sure that we engage with truly remarkably creative people in our community. The second thing is maybe uh, as a bend, bending the everyday creativity a bit to look at children. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And I think children are very interesting in the sense that they, especially quite young children, uh, where they, they are open 
maybe creative isn't quite, quite the right word, but very, very open and receptive. And, and although there are ethical difficulties in studying the children, I think they're worthy of uh, trying to address and overcome. So these are the two sort of directions that I would also like to see expanded somewhat in our community. Thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. All right, wonderful. Let's uh, conclude this uh, keynote session. And on the hour, um, everybody go back to get a tongue. There's exciting post and demo and can follow people around and talk to everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Okay, see you thank in Yellow Town. Thank you. Hey, come here. Hey, come here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Alice. Hey, Linda. Uh, thank you, thank Alison, you. for interpreting. Yay! Okay, I'm going to end meeting for all. That will kick people out, and then they'll have to go back into Gather Town. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> I think people are going already, so that's good. Yeah.